The last, the last time that I did this, I was dizzy, and this time it was just plain dumb. So I'm going to sit down to preach again today. I hope that'll be all right. Thank you very much. You're kind. Is all right. If I get fired, I'm only here two more weeks, maybe. So, <laughs> hey, we're at, we're at the end of uh, Thessalonians, and uh, in order to not be funny, I just I I was playing knockout with my grandchildren, which is a basketball game. And I did something to the muscle between my ankle and my Achilles, or my calf. So I have a boot on, and I'd rather not stumble up the steps and stumble down. So here we are. That's why we're sitting. Thanks, Don, for getting us all set up here. In the Old Testament, God revealed, or God is revealed to his people by many names that are given to him or many descriptions that are given uh, to us about him. He's identified to us as uh, names that we know, we're familiar with, God, uh, Jehovah, his personal name. Uh, he, he is uh, referred to as uh, the one who is the rock. And all of these names and descriptions give us a different picture of who God is. He, he is described to us as the one who is holy, the Holy One, the Almighty, the Mighty One, the Most High, the one who is righteous. He is described for us as a jealous God, the Lord of hosts, he is described to us. Uh, Moses wanted to know what his name was, and God said, I am that I am. He is eternally present, always is. And in the New Testament, Jesus is revealed to us by many names or descriptive phrases that are given to him. And I just cite 20 out of over 100. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is the Prince of Peace. He is the King of Kings. He is Jesus Christ, Messiah. He is the way, the truth, the life. He is a Good Shepherd. He is the horn of salvation, identified to us as the Son of God, the Word, as the Lord of Lords, identified in Revelation as the bright and morning star. If you're ever up early enough in the morning, you see that bright and morning star. Identified as Emmanuel, God with us, as an advocate, he is the Lamb of God, he is the Prince of Life, identified to us as the Savior, also as the Holy One, as the Lord Jesus Christ, as a wonderful Counselor, and he also says, I am. Jesus is the great I am. And in the benediction that we're going to consider today, we're coming to the end of uh, 2 Thessalonians. We're going to come and see three descriptive um, phrases or words uh, that describe our Lord that will benefit and bless our lives. And this is the way that Paul ends his second letter to the Thessalonians. Now... May the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. The Lord be with all of you. 
I, Paul, write this greeting uh, in my own hand, which is the distinguishing mark in all my letters. This is how I write. And his final words are, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Of all the things the Lord is, he is the Lord of peace. As the Thessalonians, as well as we Americans today, we live in times of chaos. As we have learned in the book of Thessalonians, becoming a Christian was risky business. You did not have the protection of the government. One only has to read the book of Acts to know the level of persecution uh, the early church faced. The writer of Hebrews said it this way, Remember those earlier days after you had received the light, when you stood your ground in a great contest in the face of suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You sympathized with those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. What would it be like for us to go home today after church and somebody's been in our house, the government's been in our house, and taken all of our possessions? The Hebrew writer said that's the way it was in the first century, living in times of chaos. Here in America, in North America, we don't face personal uh, uh, persecution for the most part. There is no one who is beating us up. There is no one who is throwing us in jail. We may be stymied in other ways, but physical persecution has not yet come to our shores. I think that it is true, and we know it, that we live in times of chaos and disorder. It seems to me, personal opinion, that our social media platforms provide opportunities to spew hatred and division. We must be careful, I think, in in, in, uh, my own opinion, in what we like on Facebook. Because I want us to think more deeply about whether I'm sowing discord and division, or am I helping to promote peace by my little like? Every technological advance that is made can be used by Satan to promote lies and deception and discord and false ambition and further chaos in the world. I don't know about you, but strife and disunion wears on my spirit. It does nothing to help me have peace in my life. Therefore, there are times when I just need to isolate isolate myself from TV, from radio, from any other form of media. As we all live in times of chaos, some worse than others, it's important and critical to remember that peace is not just the absence of war or conflict, but peace is to be found in a person. Jesus, God, is the Lord of peace. When Jesus was preparing his disciples for his departure, he spoke to them this way in John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. He said, do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. When Paul wrote his final words to the Thessalonians, he wished, he prayed for, he hoped for them that the Lord of peace would himself give them peace. Paul wrote elsewhere, and we sang about it this morning, of the peace of God which transcends all understanding, Philippians 4, 7. It is a supernatural peace that only the Lord can provide. And I would say to you, as I've said in the last few weeks, this is an area of life where God will do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. 
I cannot provide peace for Jolene. I cannot provide peace for my children. I cannot provide peace for you or for anyone else. It's not mine to offer. It's a peace that only comes from the one who is identified to us as the prince of peace. Boy, isn't it hard to be in the front row? Right here, the preacher's looking you right in the eye. You dare not go to sleep, had you? I don't think they usually do. Peace for you and me, the way Jesus describes it and what I read earlier, what he said, peace is a non-troubled heart. Peace is a non-fearful heart. A non-troubled heart and a non-fearful heart. What a blessing that is. In the midst of chaos and disorder, rather than shaking in fear, we can have a heart, a body, a life that is not troubled and is unafraid. Jesus can give us peace whether we are in a storm, a trial, or if we have reached the pinnacle of success. Some might say, what? Give us peace in the pinnacle of success? Well, yes, when you are at the top and you have everything, there is a world of pressure to keep yourself there. You need peace when you have climbed the ladder of success, and it is available from the God of peace. And then just to say to you, I think it will say it on the screen, peace is fully optional. I didn't know other words to use to describe what Paul said when he said that the Lord of peace would give us peace at all times and in every way. I want us to understand Paul, speaking by the inspiration of the Spirit, he covers all the bases that God will give us peace at all times and in every way. He doesn't leave any occasion when God will not give us peace. For Paul, there were no exceptions to the rule. Oh, in other words, you say, oh, God will give you peace except when a family member dies. Oh, God will give you peace except when money gets tight. Oh, God will give you peace except when chaos and invades our lives and our airways. Oh, oh, God will give you peace except when you are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Oh, God will give you peace except when, here's how it happens, three bad things happen to you at one time. Peace is fully operational when surgeries arise. Peace is fully operational when a crash occurs. Peace is fully operational when your house burns down. Peace is fully operational when a family member has something horrible happen to them. This does not mean that you don't feel anything. It doesn't mean you don't cry. It doesn't mean you don't get angry. The Bible says it's okay to get angry as long as your anger doesn't lead you into sin. Peace means his presence is with you. Hear what Paul said again in verse 16, the Lord be with all of you. His presence, you see. His presence brings peace. And there's a real power in his presence. One time a year, our Jolene's family, the Wasson family campout, occurs over uh, Labor Day. And on one particular uh, Labor Day, an issue came up that tended to put a damper over much of the crowd that was present. I wasn't there, but my, but my wife wished I would have been present. I was preaching somewhere. 
she felt like my presence would have helped the situation or that I would have known what to say or just by my being there, by my presence, the situation wouldn't have been as bad as it seemed. And I really didn't know that I mattered that much to her and her family. I have said to us before that our simple presence at a bedside, at a funeral service, at a celebration can have an amazing, calming effect on people and the situation. It's important for us to realize a few things when we are going through a crisis. We are not alone. We sang about that. The Lord put the service together. If we are Christians, oh my, how we need to remember when we're going through some kind of trial, the 23rd Psalm, right? Just to remember the words. That's exactly what you said this morning about we can pick out verses here and there, but it's good to read the whole context of of that particular uh, verse. It's good when we're going through hard times to remember that God is an ever-present help in time of trouble. It doesn't say tomorrow. It doesn't say in the past. It says an ever-present help in the time of trouble. He is with us through it all. You know, I think we need to do our best to calm ourselves down to the best of our ability, but we also need to remember that He is in us. If we are Christians, His Holy Spirit is in us, which allows us to have this peace that passes all understanding. For the one who causes chaos in the world, He is great, but what does John say? He that is greater is in us, and He is greater than he that is in the world. We can have peace in our lives when He is present. And I know and I have heard you all testify about the peace of God that has washed over you on many occasions. He is able to calm us down in the midst of a storm. I'm not opposed to counting to ten or five in order to get myself calmed down. It's not bad advice. It's good advice. But there's something even greater than just self-discipline and self-control, and that is the presence of the Lord in our lives. He is the Lord of peace. In verse 17 Uh, of our text. Paul wrote and said, I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand, which is the distinguishing mark in all my letters. This is how I write. Authenticity and forgery nowadays is still a problem. Does everybody know what Snopes, S-N-O-P-E-S, is on the Internet. It is a service that you can go to to find out if the story that you read is true or not. Is that an accurate description? Snopes, S-N-O-P-E-S. And sometimes it's hard to tell what is what and whether it's true or not. People have the ability to Photoshop, you know what that is, right? Put in or take somebody's picture out. You can plagiarize. When Paul wrote his letters to the various individuals and or churches, it appears that he had a, I'm just going to say it, um, Esther, you like this. He had a church secretary who wrote his letters for him. The official name is an amanuensis. It is a person who is writing for someone else. We know that because in, like in uh, uh, the book of Romans, 
Paul writes, or, or Tertius said, I, Tertius, am writing this letter. You can go read that. There are different places that Paul ends his letter, and he says, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Or in Galatians, he said, and it's only a six-chapter letter, he said, see with what large letters I am writing to you. He also writes similarly in the book of Colossians. But Paul adds his own autograph to authenticity, yes, as genuinely being from the hand of Paul. And you might remember that Paul asked the Thessalonians to not get alarmed, don't get unsettled by some prophecy, report, or a letter that was supposed to have come from the hand of Paul saying that the day of the Lord had already come. So it seems like in Paul's day, there, there was someone who was writing and saying, this is Paul the apostle, you know. So Paul is writing in his own hand his particular greeting. We need to remember this as when we talked last week about freeloaders in the church. What would Jesus do? When the Apostle Paul was writing, he was speaking with the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is not speaking on his own. And he is not writing on his own. He is moved and guided by the Holy Spirit. Another Apostle Peter said it this way, For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. While Paul himself wrote in Timothy, all Scripture is inspired. All Scripture is God-breathed. So what we have in Scripture, it matters. And it's important because it comes ultimately from the hand of God. I don't and I never will agree with, no offense to you if this is your past or your present I don't and will never agree with the Catholic Church that when the Pope speaks ex cathedra, he is doing the same as the prophets and apostles of old, that he is speaking for God. Ex cathedra is, a, this comes out of Webster's Dictionary, ex cathedra is a Latin phrase meaning not from the cathedral but from the chair. And the idea that it has behind it is that when the popes were speaking from their thrones, Whatever they were saying about the faith is infallible. They were speaking in behalf of God. I would not agree with that. But I would agree with what Paul said and what Peter said. They were speaking in behalf of God. Then to the last phrase. Here we go. It's a short one. Verse 18, Paul said, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. God's grace is with us. God's grace has appeared. Here's what Paul wrote in Titus, the second chapter. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled and upright and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, who are eager to do what is good. Just the fact that God came to earth is a measure of grace. It is unmerited favor. God didn't have to come, but he chose to come. He did. Emmanuel, he is God with us. The grace of God not only... In him coming to earth, he brought salvation to all men so that if they choose to accept, they can have salvation, freedom from sin, the hope of eternal life, security, deliverance, rescue, redemption. It all has been brought to us by God's grace. No one should ever think that God doesn't love them. Why, his grace has appeared and he has brought us exactly what we need in order to live with him 
forever. Grace is not something we earn. It is a gift from God. And listen, when we really, my wife could get up and give a testimony now. She loves the grace of God. She said when she began to learn and understand about the grace of God, it changed her life. She really understand about grace. God's grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness, worldly passions. God's grace was never intended to be a license uh, to sin. His grace teaches us to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age. You just listen to Adina. You talk about uh, what's going on in our world. Uh, God's grace is always needed, is it not? These people need to know about grace. And a culture of life and not a culture of death. God's grace is meant, as Paul said, to purify us for himself as a people that is his very own and as a people who are eager to do what is good. God's grace, oh, it is so undeserved and it often comes at unexpected times in our lives. Did you have a grace moment in your life recently, Rebecca? She did, but I'm not going to tell you about it. (laughs) At least I think it was. Okay. (laughs) You can ask her afterwards or ask me. We sometimes feel like we deserve such and such from God. Such is not the case. God's grace has appeared. Well, uh, let's let the worship team go up, if you will, right now. And then I have a concluding statement I want to make uh, as you're going up there. The church at Thessalonica was one great church. They were. They were a people of faith, of hope, and love. And you know what? Tri-County is too. You are a people of faith. You are a people of love. You are a people that is hoping and persevering on. The church at Thessalonica was a model church. That's the kind of description that Paul uses. They were a model church. He said the word of God rang out from them all around the countryside. The word rang out there has to do with thunder, right? Thunder, everybody hears thunder, at least in a certain locale. May the word of God sound like thunder coming out of the mouths and the lives and the hearts of people at Tri-County in this whole countryside. Persecution did not dampen their enthusiasm as they stood firm in the face of conflict. Freeloaders, as we talked about, always going to be problems in the church. But as Paul dealt with them, he said, freeloaders in the church, he instructed them and he said, you need to settle down and you need to get to work. And he spoke of the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, it makes no difference if we are dead or if we are alive when Jesus comes again. We can live together with Jesus. And for sure, the Lord is coming again. We know he hasn't come yet. But yet while we wait, we can enjoy and appreciate and be blessed by his peace and his presence and his grace. And all God's people said, amen. Let's stand up.